spring, a time of rebirth, resurrection, and regrowth. A time where a universe of wildlife suddenly emerges from its slumber to reclaim the land. Or maybe they weren't sleeping. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers, those small woodpeckers with a smear of brilliant red on their head, have been maintaining their sap wells all winter in order to capture the first bugs of spring, the midges, flies, and moths. The skunk cabbages have already started blooming, luring these bugs to assist in their pollination. It is part of the eternal game of cat and mouse, predator and prey, the hunter and the hunted. Some birds, such as our screech owls and great horned owls, have already begun to nest during the bitter cold months of January and February, and their young are just now fledging, taking advantage of the newly revealed tunnels of the mice and voles from the melting snow. They're only a small piece of the giant makeup of springtime, a time in which creatures hatch, the young grow into their own, and the wildlife around us teems with new life and vigor of survival. One of our most seasoned survivalists is the great horned owl. It's our second heaviest owl in North America. Now these fierce predators can feed on a number of things like skunks, rabbits, but they've even been known to take on other raptors like ospreys or hawks. That's how they got the name, the Tiger of the Woods. The Great Horned Owl is a dense, powerful creature that is both graceful and dangerous in its hunting habits and style of living. It poses such a great threat to its prey that mobs of American crows gather and caw at the great horns for hours. The owl is their most dangerous predator. Great horned owls typically follow their prey above treetop, their eyesight amongst the most powerfully acute in the animal kingdom. Once a creature is caught in its talons, it requires a great force to open. The owls use this deadly grip to sever the spine of large prey. Mated pairs are typically monogamous and will defend their territories with vigorous hooting, hissing, and guttural noises, eventually spreading their wings and striking with their talons if threat escalates. But one man is expertly trained to deal with these beautiful and powerful creatures. All right, so uh, we're back in the nature studio with Jim Jones, and he's from Volunteers for Wildlife. And he's brought a very special <laughs> guest with him today, <laughs> and that's uh, a great horned owl. Now, we've been trying to uh, look for some of these out in the wild, mm -hmm. and we've only heard some hoots, but now we're ready to see a nice close-up look at this uh, most dangerous predator. Yeah, he's an apex predator, and he is a hoot owl. And we'll see if he does. You can never predict it 100%. Come on, Mark. Yeah, you good boy. One foot, two feet. Come on out. You are a scream. You are a buddy. Beautiful. Yeah. Hey there. How you doing, Marcus? Hey, thanks. I need a little fanning. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So wow. So the first thing I notice when uh, when you bring Marcus out here is are those big, big eyes. Yeah. And, uh, and I noticed that he's not, uh, he's not turning his eyes at all. Uh, what's that all about? Well, his eyes are so big. Nature is very interesting that way. Nature, you get something good, you have to give up something. So what he's got is enormous eyes. If I had eyes the size of Marcus, I'd have softballs in my head. Okay, that's great. He can gather a lot more light at night. The bad part is his eyes are so big, there's no room in his skull for muscles to move them. So ah. what he's got basically is they're stuck in clay. And that's why he's always looking directly at you, which is very intimidating, but he's not trying to do that. But yeah, that's, that's the advantage and disadvantage of having those gigantic eyes. Wow. But he can see maybe eight to 11 times better than us at night. Wow, so it's not even close. Yeah. 
And I know they have a few extra vertebrae yep. back there to give them a little bit extra rotation. You got it. See, that? Uh, here we go again. Something good, something bad. So to compensate for the fact they can't move their eyes individually, um, we have about seven cervical vertebrae. Marcus has 14. 14. So he, he can move his head. People erroneously think he can spin his head all the way around. And with younger kids, I always say, to them, of course, that's ridiculous. His head would fall off. <laughs> but for a fairly flexible old guy like me, I can do about 180 if I stretch it. He can do 270, which means he can do something very disconcerting. He can face his back to you and turn his head and look right at you. And he'll do it very quickly so it looks like he's spinning all the way around. But that enables him, by the way, to, when he's flying through the forest, focusing on prey to keep his body moving. And, you know. <laughs> and he's a bit of a ham. Now, of course, his, uh, his magic weapon here uh, are those huge, enormous talons that you see here. Exactly. And, um, and Jim, you're wearing this glove <laughs> that I see to protect you from those talons. Oh, yeah. Um, I brought my uh, gauntlet in as well. And you can see what these are made of. These are made of uh, nice, thick, durable leather mm -hmm. and uh, with an extra reinforcement right here yep. around that spot <laughs> where those... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you think so too? He huh? does too. He does exactly. Yeah, if he wanted to, okay, he's never tried because Marcus, uh, because of the nature of his injury, is very calm. Don't mistake his calmness for that of a typical great horned owl. I would never hold a real great horned owl this close to my face. But if he wanted to, he could pierce that glove. And he has enough gripping strength in each talent to take a tennis ball and pop it. His gripping strength has been measured fairly equal to that of a bald eagle. And so when he wants to kill something, if he gets his talons in it, he probably will kill it. Their favorite prey on the lion, the cottontail rabbits, which they kill and then break in half with no problem whatsoever. And what about those ears? I don't see ears on them. And, uh, and some people want to think that, uh, that these tufts yeah. are the ears, yeah. but in fact, those are not the no, ears, not. right? That's exactly correct. They're just tufts. And there's a lot of explanations about why they have them. None of them are foolproof. But he does have two ears, much like we do, but one's up here, the opening, and the other one's down here. And those circular rings around his eyes don't help his eyesight, they help his hearing. They act like satellite dishes. Mm. And what they do is they channel the sound to those openings. The slight difference in time it takes for the sound to go from this ear to this ear, Marcus can calculate that as distance. But, um, <laughs> but you can see how so much of this bird <laughs> yep. is feathers because I just now touched just them, yeah, it's amazing. and that's a full finger deep there. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's, that's why they have impressive. no problems in the winter. In fact, they love the winter because no one, other, no one else is bothering them, and they can find their prey somewhat easier because they can see it against the white background. Yeah, and the other way I find them is by finding these pellets mm -hmm. with fur <coughs> and bones in them, and they're called cough pellets. Yep. And uh, it's because uh, these owls have two stomachs. Yep. So their first stomach is right here in their throat, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's their crop. And then the, they have a second stomach, of course, like we do, yep. further down in there. So. And that goes to uh, some of their other advantages. Great horned owls, like most birds of prey, are more vulnerable when they're on the ground. So we'd like to get off the ground quickly, kill it fast, which he has no trouble with, and then get away. So nature has given him an extremely big mouth. Mm. So if I had a mouth as big as his, it would go from about here to here. So we can swallow prey whole. The advantage of that is you're off the ground. The disadvantage is you can swallow stuff you can't digest. Well, nature comes up with the, uh, the two stomach. But what about the majority of our other birds? Why do they migrate south for the winter? Well, that's not entirely the right question. The right question is, why do they fly north for spring? The answer is right here. Munching on leaves or stuck in the wells of a yellow-bellied sapsucker? The answer is bugs. A huge proliferation of bugs, to be exact. The flush of spring growth in our northern woods is just the sort of feast that insects of all types can monopolize on. The explosion of spring flowers provides a huge incentive for pollinators to collect a year's worth of pollen and nectar. Next, there's a veritable layered carpet of leaves from the forest floor to the tops of the highest trees for caterpillars, beetles, and ants to harvest. Some of these bugs eat the leaves outright, while others use them to line nests, and still others, like the harvester ants, farm edible fungus from their collection of leaves. The songbirds know this, passed on through their DNA, and taught from generation to generation, 
they come here for our super abundance of bugs. And they can raise not one, not two, but up to three broods of chicks on the huge amount of insects that we have going on every spring right here. And it's worth it for them to leave the tropics and fly two to 3,000 miles to right here, even in your backyard in the town of North Hempstead, to do this. And here's somebody in the town of North Hempstead that's making a difference in our local forests. I have with me Eagle Scout Luke Spawn, who took it upon himself as part of his project to make owl nests, great horned owl nests. Yes. So tell us what you did. All right, thank you, Ranger Powers. Um, so for my Eagle project, I wanted to do something that would benefit the environment. So I, with your help, we came up with the idea of helping the local great horned owl population. So I went around and I wasn't really sure how to build this, but with the recommendation from Mr. Jones at Bethpage State Park, uh, he gave me this structure, which is completely all natural. It's made from just tar paper, vines, and some zip ties. And it works about 70% of the time, actually. So with his help and your help, I, was, I went around to local parks like right here, Clark Botanical Gardens, uh, Malvern High School, and the Garden City Bird Sanctuary. It took us a couple tries to figure out the right way to do it, but it's just a cone, a cone of tar paper, and then it's kind of structured with the vines around to help hold it in place mm. and there's a yes and there's steel cable around the edge so mm -hmm. that we can secure it into the trees more stably right so let's see the back side of that oh yes it's covered around with chicken wire too to help hold the structure fantastic and yes. so any rain or, or anything is just going to yes. seep right through there's this. a hole we've created a hole in the middle so that everything you know kind of drains out great and you gave him a, a good start with uh, sticks i see yes exactly. right here because as we know great horned owls like to take over yeah, exactly. a nest so it, it is kind of already started there for him yes. so wow and someone else that's helping the town of north hempstead make a difference in uh, our forest is councilman peter zuckerman so thank you so much for coming my pleasure happy to be here yeah so what are some things that uh, town of north hempstead is doing to help us out out here well we here at the town of north hempstead use integrated pest management and what we mean to do is we try for natural solutions we try to stay away from harmful pesticides and sprays we've enlisted the help of organic solutions they're a company out of the Bayless gardening center in Port Washington that uses natural products and natural solutions in addition to that we have approximately 15 bat houses here on the premises we also put uh, fish in the ponds to eat the larvae from the insects in addition to that we release ladybugs and praying mantises into the garden to try to help uh, with the insects. And we use, try to use all natural products and pesticides, so we, just, we avoid pesticides. Great. I really appreciate that uh, you guys are using uh, uh, options out there that are not chemicals, because those chemicals uh, can go out in the environment and have a magnifying effect and affect so many other things, including even our honeybees. Well, I'll tell you, we have. 15 bat houses here on the premises. And those 15 bat houses are very important because those bat houses uh, can eat, they can eat almost a thousand mosquitoes an hour, each, uh, each of those. So it's very important to us. And actually people could put bat houses on their own premises and get rid of those uh, mosquito zappers that you see in the stores. Absolutely, so I know online there's a lot of different uh, bat house designs that people could uh, easily look up and uh, build themselves. It'd be a great, uh, great family project to yeah. put some of these up in, in everybody's backyard. Reducing chemicals not only helps our good insect populations, but it also helps the other animals higher up in the food chain. One of the animals this effort really helps is the screech owl. The screech owl is a magnificent bird of prey disguised in a compact package. The screech owl is only 7 to 10 inches tall, and it has a wingspan of 18 to 24 inches. However, their small size is a benefit to these graceful hunters of the sky. They are extremely agile. The brown hues and patterns of their feathers help them camouflage against the tree bark. They have well-developed raptorial claws and a curved bill, both used as tools to tear apart their prey into bite-sized pieces. Their normal territorial call is not a hoot, but a trill, 
consisting of more than four individual calls per second, each given in rapid succession. Like the great horned owl, flocks of birds may mob the screech owl, swooping around it and making noisy calls to alert other nearby birds. But don't let the screech owl's small frame fool you. Even as nestlings, they fiercely fight against each other for food, sometimes even killing smaller siblings. But it's all just a small flicker in the larger circle of life and the age-old concept of survival of the fittest. Well, we're back here in the nature studio with Jim Jones uh, from Volunteers for Wildlife. So thank you so much for uh, coming back. Oh, good. And uh, we welcome. were talking about another owl out there that we've uh, been putting up these uh, owl boxes like yeah. this to try to attract this smaller owl. Yep. And I hear that you have one in uh, at the Volunteers for Wildlife uh, yep. in rehab. Yep. And uh, it's a screech owl. Sure is. In fact, we have three of them. Uh, screech owls. Let's just take Orlando out. Come on, you. Ah, cutie. How you doing, Orlando? And the first question we always get is, oh, he's so cute. Uh, when's he going to grow up? <laughs> no, he's completely grown. He's full grown. When they're born, they're only about this big. And Orlando is a classic example of a screech owl. On Long Island, they come in two color varieties. This orangish red, and they also come in gray. And the gray, more people recognize it being camouflaged. But actually, this color is very good camouflage against certain kinds of pine trees, mm -hmm. pitch pines and stuff like that. And that's where they really like to hang out during the day. Fabulous. Yeah. And I remember um, you showing us the great horned owl, mm -hmm. and they had that disc on their face. Yep. Um, I can clearly see a disc <laughs> on this guy's face as well. And also those two. Yeah. Um, those two tufts? Owls in general have a lot of things in common. They almost all of them have gigantic eyes, and that's for nocturnal feeding, although not all owls hunt at night, but screech owls do. So he does have those huge eyes again, and these tufts. And we were talking about that before. Um, there are numerous possibilities about why owls have tufts. None of them can be certain. We don't know, because there are owls the same size as Orlando who don't have them, and he's fine. So we don't know. They do break up the pattern of his head, might be better camouflage. Okay, they do indicate his emotions. When he's very alert, they're up. Sometimes when he's irritated, they're back down. But we just don't know. Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, one, of, one of the other things I'm comparing, actually, yeah. with the great horned owl uh, are the talons. Mm -hmm. And these talons are much smaller. Mm -hmm. What is, uh, uh, what are screech owls feeding on okay. with those smaller talons? They are much smaller, but they still have that distinctive pattern, two in the front, two in the back. That gives them a wider spread so they can grab things. Uh, Orlando loves small mice and rodents like that. He'll take birds on the wing at night, and he's a real fan of cicadas. Mm, yeah, they're yummy. perfect for him, yeah, and he'll just eat them and eat them and eat them. Um, in fact, because we feed them, obviously, dead mice uh, every day, they get two or three, but when it's cicada season, if one comes through, they more than happily go after him. So he'll eat stuff like that. So he's a smaller predator and, so, and very active during the night, but during the day, he likes to hide in hollowed out trees or in cavities like this. That's also where they nest. He's a beautiful yeah, creature, and he's I can gorgeous. see how, how those stripes would help him just Mm -hmm. camouflage right into, yep. uh, especially like a, a pine tree. And notice he doesn't make much sound at all when he hunts, when he flies. He's, he's got all those things. He, however, is not a hoot owl like Marcus was. Uh, he doesn't hoot at all. Now, if you can't find them, because they're very secretive and they're very small and mm -hmm. they hang out in places you won't find them, if you go out at night, and you've done it, oh, yeah. and you make that noise, <whistles> he's, he's better than me, they will answer you. And then you'll know they're there. However, Always remember, when they make that noise, they're responding to you as either a possible mate, mm -hmm. you and I aren't good for that, or a rival. And so you better wear a hat, because occasionally when they come by, you won't hear them, you won't see them, and you all of a sudden, you know, he's here. <laughs> right. And they might just sit right next to you and just say, you know, you, you're not really a screech owl. And the other thing I like to point out, too, is that they're, <laughs> they're territorial. They're making that to claim their territory. Oh, yeah. So if you, I've seen people just continue to call, continue to call, <sighs> continue to call. And what they're doing is they're winning. Exactly. And then the owl has to move out of their territory. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't think we're prepared to take up residence in that tree. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, so it's fun to do it. But then, yeah. uh, but then know when enough is enough and, uh, and let them be. I know uh, attracting these owls to your backyard is relatively easy. It really is. It really and, is. Uh, and I brought in a sample of 
a screech owl nest box mm -hmm. that I have used on numerous occasions. And this, this design is up in a lot of people's backyards mm -hmm. and in several uh, parks all across Long Island. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the key of it here is the, the, um, the hole size. Yeah, exactly. And if it's too big, you just get squirrels. If it's too small, he can't fit in it. Yep. So, um, so it's got to be, so, uh, so look at your measurements. Make sure all your uh, dimensions are correct on these. I find that with these uh, screech owl boxes, bigger is slightly better. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so they'll, they'll move in more readily the, the larger it is. And the one key piece that I've I found very important is that the lid you have to have access to it you do. Um, in order to clean it out, but it does have to be secure. Oh, yeah. So that raccoons cannot open that lid when you don't want them to. Birds of prey, the raptor species of the sky that are apex predators, magnificent in their dangerous glory, soaring high above our heads, but how do we get a closer look? How do we really pry into their secret lives? Hungry to get a glimpse into the wild that is often so unattainable in our everyday lives? The answer lies in choosing the right tools. More specifically, the binocular. It's amazing to get really close like I was with the great horned owl or the screech owl, but it's taken the handlers and I years of training and experience to get that close. But one way you can get closer to wildlife is by using the right pair of binoculars, or as I say, binos. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about how to select a pair of binos and get rid of the confusion about buying them. First of all, binos are rated by two sets of numbers, like seven by 35 is a common one. My pair here is an eight by 40. This pair here is a 10 by 50. The first number is the magnification of this first lens. It magnifies my vision seven, eight, or 10 times my normal vision. The second number is how big the second lens is in millimeters. So the bigger this lens, the more light it lets in, which means you can see better in low light conditions, such as a cloudy day or dusk. But also, the bigger the lens, the bigger the binoculars you really want to carry these huge things around. So usually you select the biggest size that you can comfortably carry around your neck. Also, I recommend buying a nicer pair that will endure the years. Mine are waterproof and drop proof, but you pay for that. If you plan on birding for many years to come, you should try to buy the most expensive pair that makes sense for your budget. Before I bought my nice pair, I was buying a new one every other year or so. But then again, I'm outdoors constantly and give these things a real beating. You weigh the facts and decide for yourself. Now that we understand how birds survive the winter through migration, an even larger question now looms over us. How do the insects survive the winter? Unfortunately for that, the answer is as diverse as the insects themselves. Some of our insects, such as our dragonflies and monarchs, migrate south with the songbirds before winter takes hold, only to return in early summer. A few of our insects, such as flies and some species of beetles, have specially adapted to hibernating, or in the case of the morning cloak butterfly, even freezing solid and reanimating on warm spring days. But by far, the strategy of the vast majority of insects die at first frost putting the survival of their species solely into their eggs. Only their eggs have the ability to endure the frigid temperatures, the biting frosts, and the torrents of snow. And each species is timed precisely to hatch or reemerge at exactly the same time as its host plant flowers or leaves out. It's one of nature's greatest alarm clocks, as old as the seasons themselves. One of our best known insects, and one of my personal favorites because of the divine sweetness they give us, is the European honeybee. I once again find myself back here at Clark Botanic Gardens, where apiarists Rich and Helen maintain the six resident hives. Here, the pair gives me an inside look into these most remarkable insects. The bees out in the wild 
build their uh, cells out of wax, octagon shape. They make frames duplicating the same shape. And what the bees do, they'll fill, fill those cells out with actual wax and then fill it up with honey and cap it. Then we take it, uncap it, spin it out, that's been spun, and then we bottle it. So this, I see right now they're coming in and out uh, yeah. of the beehives. And, uh, and what I want you guys to notice is uh, from some of their entrances, they have a flyway which takes them out into, uh, into the world around us here. And, uh, and they go out and they search for flowers and that's where they're pulling uh, nectar. And they fly back then and come right back to their exact hive. This is one of the most amazing things because you can have several hives right next to each other and they don't mistake that one from that one, they return to their hive. And you'll notice that they're mostly interested in getting to and from their hive. I'm standing right here in their flyway and not getting stung, at least not yet. So what's going on inside here now? So what we do in the early season, we, we supplementary feed them with sugar water these are mayonnaise jars with caps, little holes. The bees come up and suck the sugar water out. And you can see the bees here. Ah, yes. But most of them are down here. And they're in there busily working on, uh, on filling up those beehives right now. And hopefully, by the end of June, they will actually fill a, a soup. This is called a super with 10 frames. They'll actually fill all of these frames up with honey. Wow. It's a lot of work. I don't know how they do it. And when this is fully capped, this will weigh maybe 35, 40 pounds of honey besides the actual weight. That's amazing. I don't know how they do it. Well, they never, as far as I know, they never sleep, you know? <laughs> and now each one of these hives has one queen in it. Is right. that right? Right. And she has a scent that they recognize, and that's why they go back to their own hive. So Rich and Helen are gonna open this uh, beehive up so we can see the actual activity. We have a smoker here on the side, and that helps to calm them down a bit. And what you're gonna see here are all these girls, all these bees, sitting here working on filling up each one of these frames. Unfortunately, despite hives like these, honeybees are experiencing a crisis, which may have something to do with a phenomenon called colony collapse disorder. Colony collapse disorder is a phenomenon in which worker bees from a European honeybee colony abruptly disappear. While many disappearances have occurred historically, in 2006, a drastic rise in the number of disappearances of Western honeybee colonies occurred in North America vicious and ultimately mysterious. The mechanisms of CCD and the reasons for its increasing prevalence remain unclear, but many possible causes have been proposed, including use of pesticides or infections with mites, malnutrition, genetic factors, immunodeficiencies, loss of habitat, changing beekeeping practices, or a combination of these factors. But is there anything the average person can do from home to help slow this phenomenon? Well, the answer is yes. If you want to help out the honeybees, the obvious thing is to use fewer chemicals, less pesticides, things like that. But if you want to support our native bees, there's actually something you can create, build it, and put it up in your own backyard. And that's what I like to call a bee block. It's a uh, untreated, piece of 4x4, four four, could be any length at all, and here's one that I purchased online with uniform holes drilled in it. Now our native bees are not going to be the colony nesters that the European honeybees are. They're going to be solitary nesters. One bee is going to be living and nesting in each hole, and the new prototypes that I've created are uh, a series of whole sizes. As a matter of fact, I use five different 
hole sizes going across uh, horizontally across the B block like this. And what I'm finding is with those five different sizes, large to small, is that they all get used. We have native bees of every size and configuration that you can imagine. And, and putting them up, you can, since it's a four by four post, you can either sink it right into your garden or you can also attach it to uh, other posts or rails that are around your house already. All the bee blocks that I've put up have had between 80 to 100% residency in there. That's just amazing. So you're doing something positive right in your own backyard to support our native bees. So in this episode, we learned all about the birds and the bees. These amazing creatures follow cyclical patterns through the seasons and adapt alongside nature. So if you want to follow us, please visit uh, Your Connection to Nature, that's yc2n.com. And you can follow other episodes of Off the Trail at mynhtv.com. So until the next time, we'll see you off the trail.